never, ever, ever disregard an eight-year-old who has a dream of becoming like Oprah one day because she might just become like Oprah one day. Noor Tagori is a Libyan-American storyteller and journalist and is currently one of the most talked about young adults in the country. She's known as being the first hijab-wearing news anchor on American television. Obviously, it has not been an easy path to get where she is today. Growing up, Noor never had a role model that looked like her. She wanted to be on TV, but nobody she saw on TV looked like her. And before she knew the terms diversity or inclusivity, she knew that there was a glaring lack of it on television. Years later though, after years of hard work, after honing her storytelling abilities, pursuing this passion and this dream, she ended up working on CBS radio and Newsy and CTV News, and she's blown up. Even if you don't recognize Nora's name, you may have seen her face while scrolling through Facebook or watching videos online. She is a magnetic personality. She's great at what she does and she tells stories that matter. And we love that. This is Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey. I am Brandon Harvey. And every single week we have conversations with people who are rejecting cynicism, doing the impossible and fighting to make the world a better place. I actually got to have this conversation with Noor in person at her studio office where she does all of her storytelling. But instead of her telling stories of what's going on in the world as a journalist, we talked about her story. We dove into what it was like growing up, what it was like for her to pursue this dream, to do the impossible, and then to eventually become the first hijab wearing news anchor on American television. We talked about her journey to achieving her dreams of exposing cultural injustices and combating the challenges facing women on a global scale. We talked about the project she's working on now and what her dreams are for the future. This was an amazing conversation. I loved getting to meet Nora. I've admired her for a long time. And so without any further ado, let's just jump straight into the conversation. Here we go. It's so good to be here with you in Washington, D.C. So great. Like, I have such a special place in my heart for people from Nashville. So, I'm all really thanks happy. to Ruthie Lindsay, right? Yes, shout out to Ruthie. And I loved, I loved the interview that you did with her. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's so, I, I love Ruthie. Gives Ruby. me chills. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny because I've admired you for probably years at this point. I don't know when I first came across one of your stories, but I think it was on Facebook and I was scrolling through and you know how you kind of scroll past <laughs> those videos. I was like captivated your personality and just the, you actually, you carry yourself with a lot of joy regardless of whatever story you're telling. And I remember being like, this is amazing. And then I like auto played the next video. And so I had you on my short list of people I wanted to have on the podcast for a long time. And then I was talking to Ruthie and she's always been so supportive and she's like, hey, I've got this one friend, she's in DC, you should have her on the show. And it was you. And so uh, I'm super glad that we That's, get to do this. Oh my gosh, fate. So I'm in your office right now. Yeah. Tell me what you do. So we're in the Scripps DC Bureau right now. I work for Newsy and we're currently working on a documentary series that I'm hosting and um, helping produce about sex trafficking in the US. Um, so it's a huge hot topic. I think sex trafficking in general is a pretty hot topic. But when you talk to uh, your average, you know, American citizen about what that looks like to them, they often go to uh, Cambodia or Thailand mm. or movies like Taken. Yeah. And they aren't really familiar with the fact that, no, this actually is happening closer than you think. Mm. And I know that people always say, you know, it's happening in your backyard, but realistically, like it is, it's something that's happening in schools and workplaces and all over. Um, and so we are taking this issue and we're breaking it down and dissecting it into six different episodes and focusing on causes, solutions, talking to survivors and talking about like the legalization debate when it comes to prostitution. So we're delving in from all different angles. And it's one of those things where I've been so passionate about this issue since I was 14 years old. 
And I've covered, I've written papers on this. I've um, done volunteer work. I've done stories. And now I'm doing this like dream series, this dream documentary series. And I went into this kind of knowing and thinking like I knew everything um, about this topic. And it's one of those things that you go into it and you think you know everything and you're constantly Mm -hmm. learning and you constantly realize you really don't know as much as you think you know. And um, so there's this constant like internal struggle of growth and learning about, about the issue and realizing that it's not black and white. I love that you're doing that. I love that so much. So it's like a self, it's been like a journey for myself and for our team, but it's also we're coming up with a product that is going to blow people's mind. Like the series, like I'm the stuff that our videographer Kevin has shot and our producer Kate is incredible. Like the, the stories that we're putting together have taken hours. Like, like we spend so many hours on every one of these trips and has taken such like an emotional and personal toll because we have become a part of this. Like, and we're so, like deep into this that um that you just can't go a day without talking about yeah. it or thinking about it um and so we're i'm really excited we're actually going to um vegas this weekend and covering one of the episodes is about the legalization debate um and then right after that we're going to kentucky for the second time um to further one of the episodes that we're doing on heroin wow I can just hear the passion in your voice oh when you're God. talking about this. <laughs> and I want to dive deeper into human trafficking, where that passion started in a little bit. But you are so at home in the world of producing these ideas and conveying messages. And this is a complex topic. And this seems like this is your core passion. So your your professional job, would you say you are a journalist? Is that what you'd say? Yeah. I mean, I, I say to make it, even more simple I just say I'm a storyteller Mm. so I just I tell my story I tell other people's stories I get people to I give people a platform to share their own stories and so just it's kind of all encompassing everything that I touch or everything that I work on is some form of storytelling and so right now with what I'm doing it's storytelling through video or it's storytelling through taking a stage and, and talking before hundreds or thousands of students or storytelling through last year I did a clothing line collaboration with listen up clothing and we produced a line of clothes that benefited um victims of trafficking yeah yeah so it's it's and it looked good yeah it was awesome and it was like I I wrote a piece for the clothes and it was the first time in years that I had written like a, a poem and it was a means of giving people a story to wear on their back so it's something that like i try to touch that's cool that's a cool way of looking yeah so i mean it's yeah it's everything to me let's bring it back to the beginning of when storytelling started for you because (laughs) i love this idea of storytelling you're really good at it looking back with hindsight can you see that in yourself as a child Oh, absolutely. I don't think it's, it's not even a matter of, can I see that? So can I see that in myself as a child? Like every single person around me saw that. I think every single teacher I've had, every single mentor, my parents, I mean, I always knew that I was good at asking questions and telling stories. Like I was obsessed with reading and writing and I kept journals and I went to the library every other day and I would constantly, constantly read. So I was obsessed with stories in general, but I remember just like feeling insecure about not being good at sports or not being good at art and just trying to find what it is that I was good at. And then I realized compared to the people around me that asking questions just came so naturally to Mm. me and questions that, that people recognized as, Oh my gosh, that's a good question. Or I didn't think of that. Or getting two people to talk and share each other's stories that never would have. I remember when I was, I think 12 years old, my grandmother took me to a mosaic class and it was a bunch of senior citizens um, working on their little mosaics. And I was so curious just to know how these people came into the room together. And I started asking everyone questions. And I remember, I'll never forget this. This old man told me at the end when I was about to leave, he was like, you know, we've been in this room together for the past three months and haven't known more than each other's names. And now you got to share all of our life stories. And how old were you? I was 12, I think. That is unreal. And I think that's when it hit. Like, that's what I remembered. I was like, this is a thing that I can do. And it's so important too. Yeah. I mean, wow. it's important to do, but it was also important for my self-esteem at the time. Cause I was just like, I'm not really good at anything. <laughs> so what, what is it that like is my thing? You yeah. know? And I feel like when you're young, you're always looking for 
what your thing is. And, and normally that was your thing is something pretty straight up. It's like, I am the one who's good at math. I'm the one who's good at basketball. <laughs> and storytelling usually isn't on that list of options. It's not something that you can even recognize. And I think that part of that is if you are a storyteller, if you're naturally a storyteller, you're also naturally critical of yourself. Oh, um, yeah. And and that's because storytelling puts you in such a vulnerable place. It makes you really think about like how much you're willing to share with other people, how much people are willing to share about themselves. Um, and it's it's just so intimate. It's like it's more intimate sometimes than a physical touch. And so you want to make sure that like you are comfortable with sharing what you're about to write or what you're going to say. And um, it puts you in that position of like really having to embrace that vulnerability. Wow. There's a lot of ways that you can tell stories in the world. There's, you can be a songwriter, you can be a filmmaker, you can be a person who literally just goes up on stage and tells stories. There's a multitude of ways. You are a journalist among other things, but that's, you know, we're in that you're place where journalism happens was that a passion from the beginning or was that of kind of the goal for you um I think the goal for me was being Oprah like that's all I wanted really? to ever do yeah I was tell me about how old. that came about I mean my mom would watch Oprah at 4 p.m sharp every single day I got home probably like at 4 12 every single day <gasps> the bus would drop me off and I would just run into my house and throw my book bag in the corner of the kitchen and sit down on the couch with my mom and watch wow and I was so mesmerized by how she asked questions and she told stories funny thing is I I didn't know what a journalist was. I didn't know that was a, like a term. Yeah. I just knew that there were people on TV who told stories and asked questions and that's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until like middle school that my dad was like, you're going to be a journalist one day. Like this is your thing. Mm. And, um, and I learned the term. Wow. That's really, really cool. What was the next step after you kind of, I, I would imagine that at that point it became a little bit of your identity. You're like, I'm a storyteller oh, who like yeah. maybe is going to be Oprah one day. No, it, um, I, it wasn't even a maybe. It was I'm going to be Oprah one day. Yeah, I have people who will message good. me now and say, I remember we were on the bus in third grade and you were saying <sighs> that one day you were going to be Oprah. No. Yeah. That's so good. And I'm just like, damn right. Like, so, <laughs> that's what I was going to do. You have to trust an eight-year-old. So what's your next step then? When you're, you know, you're an eight-year-old and you're going to be Oprah, yeah. how do you take your first step towards being Oprah? Besides like eating bread and giving away stuff um reading reading all the time i remember watching her talk about her obsession with reading and how that was like the key to everything for her and so i obsessively read and i wrote and i found my voice through my writing and i also just was very very vocal about this dream that i wanted to to be like her one day and my parents would put me in like TV camp and reading camp and writing camp mm. and broadcast camp and creative writing camps and all of that. Um, and eventually when I was old enough to get an internship, uh, my mom would drive me to the internships. One time I remember Ted Koppel had opened a wing at the hospital that my dad worked at and my dad made me read up about Ted Koppel and took me to the hospital to meet him and said, you need to, you need to meet this man. He's a huge like journalist who was covering, um, the war in Iran and you need to be, or the hostage crisis in Iran, you need to be like connected with him. And I was 15 years old and I remember wow. going there and there was all and this press. Did you press. grow up here in DC? I grew up in Southern Maryland. Southern Maryland. Got it. Yeah. So I grew up in a very conservative, very white town. Uh. Um, and that had a huge part in, in the identity crisis that I went through while I was figuring out this passion. But yeah, so I remember just being at the hospital with Ted Koppel and all the press and media was there and they were trying to ask him questions but I ended up asking him questions and talking to him and he never ended up talking to the press. And I remember wow. my dad getting in a little trouble for that, but worth it. Yeah, totally worth it. That's Cause eventually actually a few years later, I found a, a Ted Koppel event in DC and I took my dad to it. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. That's really fun. What's the name of the hospital? We'll give them a shout out now since they didn't get that shout out on uh, the press back <laughs> in the day. Oh my gosh. St. Mary's hospital in Leonard town. There we go. Shout out right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about, the identity crisis you were experiencing at this time then? Um, so, I mean, I like I said, I grew up in a very small, white, conservative town. Um, I always describe it by my experience in first grade. I walked into my class and I sat down next to the only other girl who had dark brown hair. Mm. And I asked her if she was Muslim because I had never seen another girl at school with dark brown hair. And she looked at me funny and was like, am I what? I remember she's, she was actually, her family was Italian. So from then until I moved out of that town, I was very insecure about 
like who I, who I was and who I wanted to be. And I think that when you're growing up, especially, I mean, at the time, everybody I saw on TV was besides Oprah was blonde hair and blue eyed. Like I was just thinking mm. about this earlier, actually, like our role models and the, the TV shows we were watching were Lizzie McGuire and Hannah Montana. And yeah. these are like, there was no blonde one. Hair, blue eyes. Yeah. There was no one who looked like me ever. Yeah. And so I, I like struggled with that a lot because I was like, well, I want to be on TV, but nobody on TV looks like me. So I don't know how that's going to happen. And I, I went through such a hard, like a, like a, such an identity crisis that I remember as soon as I was allowed to, I like would get tons of blonde streaks in my hair. I'd wear like colored contacts and I just was just like, I'm going to be this person that I wasn't. Wow. Yeah. And I like went through that until I moved out of that town. Well, and the, yeah. Cause there was nobody that you, could see yourself as so you no. became your role models yeah i had n- i never ever 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 growing up had a role model who looked like me wow except for my mom because i am a blonde haired blue-eyed male yeah. i've got plenty of people who look like me most of them end up bald uh but close enough um it's funny though because today it's a whole different story i think yeah. with social media we are so we're exposed to so many like diverse people who totally. are doing amazing things and so I feel so like lucky to see other girls have other people that they could look up to because like my generation, we didn't have that, Mm -hmm. but it's also, it's like a double edged sword because we're also growing up in the time of social media where like these young girls are struggling with so many other things um, Mm. and so many other things to be insecure about. So it's, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, that was my little, my little identity crisis. Wow. Okay. So Walk me through, you get out of high school, you'd already met this fantastic journalist, you were going to become Oprah. Yeah. What was your first kind of foray into the world of journalism? Mm. So that story actually coincides with um, when I first put on the hijab. So I was very Mm. sure about two things growing up. One, that I was going to be Oprah. Yeah. And two, that I was never going to wear the headscarf. What was your reasoning behind that? Because before I knew the terms diversity or like inclusivity, I knew there was a glaring lack of it on television. Yeah. And that in order for me to be on TV, I was never going to wear it. And because my obviously my parents can't force me to put it on, they knew that this is what I wanted to do. So they never thought I was going to put it on either. Wow. And we moved out of that town and right we moved right outside of DC and I like felt this kind of sense of culture shock and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much diversity. I've never experienced this Mm. and all these people are just embracing themselves and if they can do it, then why can't I? And so one day I impulsively put on the hijab. Very Like I don't have a, I can't tell you like that I felt ready or that I felt like I'd reached this pinnacle of piety or righteousness. Like there wasn't anything like that. I just did it. Yeah. And, um, And so from there I ended up deciding that if I was going to do this, I was still going to pursue storytelling, Mm. but I needed to figure out, um, a way to get a head start. And so I, which is crazy because you were in some ways, or you could even think of it this way as you were giving yourself like a time delay. You weren't getting a head start. You're saying, I'm going to put on the hijab and that might make it more difficult for me to pursue this It was dream. going to make it more difficult for me to pursue it. So I, I was like, I'm giving myself... So two things happened. One, I, the, the reason I ended up deciding to put on the hijab or to keep it on, because I feel like a lot of people, when they saw me put it on, were like, yeah, she's not going to keep it on. <laughs> but one of the reasons I like... I don't know how people are going to take this, but was that I ended up getting an internship at a newspaper right after. And I realized Mm. maybe I can do this. Like there's like, I'm getting this internship. I'm 15, 16 years old. So let's see what happens. And then I tested into an honors program at our local college. And I was sitting in the car with my mom and she was like, well, why don't you just homeschool the rest of your high school and start college early? Mm. so that you can get this head start. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I can get out of high school early, yay. And I ended up starting college at 16. Wow. So when I got into college, I worked for the school paper. Um, I started like shadowing people and didn't take journalism classes right off the bat, just a couple because I was still doing my gen ed. But a few days after I turned 18 years old, I was spontaneously offered an internship at CBS radio. How did that happen? Um, it was kind of a crazy story. So I would always 
like tell people I was a broadcast journalism major, even though I wasn't yet. And that's the way to do it. Yeah. I was just putting that out there, you know, whenever you <laughs> have the chance, it into existence. you have to. And I am 110% like a believer of that. So anyway, I had gotten a full ride scholarship to journalism school for the following fall. So this was a few days after my birthday is November 27th. And I had a, a poetry performance on World AIDS Day, which is December 1st. So a few mm, days later, yeah. just turned 18. So I was finally eligible for these like internships, right? And the night before the poetry performance, I was applying to um, internships for radio stations, for newspapers, for television stations. I was even like applying for flight attendant jobs because I was like, maybe I can be a flight attendant because I like traveling and I would have this time off in the spring. And... Uh, before I went to sleep, I prayed what we call in Islam istikhara, which is the guidance prayer. And I specifically asked, I was just like, hey, God, I really need an internship or a job. Can you help me out? Okay, thanks. Love you. Bye. And went to sleep, woke up. And the next day on stage, I was performing this poem. But I had introduced myself as a broadcast journalism major. Mm. And afterwards, uh, this woman came up on stage. There was a few hundred people in the crowd. And she looked at me and was like, Noor, you're a broadcast journalism major. And I was just like, crap, like she knows I'm lying. All these people are going to know I'm lying. I don't know what to do. And um, instead she said, uh, well, my name is Justine Love and I'm the director of community and public affairs at CBS radio. And I want you to intern for us. What did that, what did that feel like? Just like that. I think like I, like my jaw dropped I like talked to her for a few seconds afterwards. We exchanged information and, and then I went. I just started crying. Like I wow. called my mom and I started crying because I was freaking out. Like I and I was like, if there is ever a point in my life that I needed to be assured that this is exactly what I was meant to be doing, that was that moment. Wow. So yeah, that That's was amazing. what that basically kicked off the rest of my like. I had been writing for newspapers. I've had I had a job in that, um, and I wanted to take it to the next step and. I got this radio internship and ever since then everything kind of wow. just went up. Yeah. And so you start working in radio, but of course in radio, no one can see if you're wearing the hit job. Yeah. So I actually started working in music before I started working in news. Okay. It actually kind of like, it ended up being great because I worked in music. Um, at, it was a DC based station, WPGC. So it's a hip hop urban music station. And within the year of me interning there, they opened up a news station. Oh, cool. So they had like an actual news radio station. So it was like a transition. So I started interning there, got a job there. Then I started. Um, and then once they had the news station open, I ended up getting a job there. Got it. That's amazing. Tell me then how you transitioned from the whole world of radio over to the world of visual. Where like I'm able to see you on Facebook and people are able to watch your content and your stories are visual. So I actually stayed in radio even while I was doing television. Okay. Um, I just kind of kept that job because I loved working for CBS at the time. I ended up starting journalism school while I was there. And so I was working in radio, going to journalism school and working full, like having a full-time internship at a television station. Wow. So that was my first um, in was uh, an internship at our, it was actually WSA9, which is the CBS affiliate here in DC. So I had an internship, working full-time school, working overnights at the radio station. It was a super hectic ske schedule. <laughs> and then I actually started speaking on top of all of that. So it was wow. like, I was not sleeping for like a couple of years. And, um, but my in was at that television station. And then after I graduated from journalism school, I took a job at a local television station. Mm. And, um, so I worked there for a while. And after that, I ended up doing a documentary independently, um, just on my own and did a few stories on my own just to put up online and um then what among all of that what was the moment that felt the most exciting for you or the most like i feel like i i'm i'm really oprah right now mm, that's a great question and the reason for that is because that was a turning point in my career okay so i was struggling a lot at the local station um i had finally gotten hired at a tv station which was great because i it was hard for me to get a job yeah um because nobody had ever put a woman with hijab on television so, um, I was having a hard time getting stories cause people would just say like mean things. They would say like, we don't talk to people who look like you. Mm. Um, 
so I actually, I actually hated Nashville before I went there and met Ruth, Ruthie and <laughs> Tiffany and Bonnie Kate. Well, I had known Tiffany. And part of that was because of an experience that I had. I was speaking at Vanderbilt University and I was covering a story for school and I got like major harassment. I don't know if you've ever seen this video, but there's like super harassed by um, one of the GOP candidates and her like whole crew there I, while I was covering a story. Wow. Um, just like calling me a terrorist and saying like, we don't like they basically that she was terrified of me and that, I don't know, like just really nasty things. Um, there's it's a whole terrible. video about it, but I was just like, Oh, I hate this place. You know, like these people were just, they were just so ignorant, so hurtful, whatever. Anyway, so I had a hard time while I was covering stories. And one time um, I was doing a story with our videographer and she was like this young black woman with dreads and we would always call ourselves the best worst team because whenever we would go out, like people would just give us crap. Mm. But when she would go out with reporters who were white, it'd be fine or who weren't Muslim. And one time we went out for a story um, and we had a really hard time couple days later we went out and we covered a follow-up story during the Baltimore protests in 2015 and we had covered the regular story um all mainstream media was kind of just parked outside of city hall yeah. I don't know if you remember the coverage it was pretty terrible during the time so we were just parked out and we got the story that we needed but we were walking back to our car and this man comes up to us and says um walk down a couple of blocks and you'll see one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen so I was just like, okay. So we walked down a couple of blocks before we leave. And we saw one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And it was uh, people outside wearing I Bleed Orange shirts, crying and laughing and singing. And a Michael Jackson impersonator on the tops of cars dancing. And people just coming up to us saying, oh my gosh, like, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you wow. how I feel. And that had never happened before. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, And Eric and I the videographer, we looked at each other and we were just like, oh my God, this is like, this is it. This is what we were meant to be doing. And we sat in the car afterwards and we like cried together. And we were just like, this is the story. This is the kind of story that was meant for us. Wow. And I quit my job shortly after that because I was just like, those are the stories I need to go after. And yeah. I realized that all this time I was trying to be somebody else. I was trying to be like the reporters that I had seen on television when in reality, me being the best version of myself yeah. was the was what was going to give me a story that somebody else wouldn't have gotten. And that was a very Oprah move of me anyway, because I remember <laughs> that she she was actually a reporter. She started in local news in Baltimore. And there's several times she's talked about how when she was a reporter, she would always want to be like Barbara Walters. And so she would try to talk like Barbara Walters. And one time on television she had pronounced Canada Canada <laughs> and laughed at herself and then realized that she would be a much better Oprah than somebody trying to be Barbara Walters mm. and I realized that I would be a much better nor than I would being everyone else that I was trying to be and so I ended up quitting my job and I pursued doing a documentary on my own wow. um, in DC and I was just, I put my heart and like everything into this piece um, so it was like l less than 20 minutes. Um, it's called the Forest Haven story, the troubles they've seen. And after I did that, I kind of put it out and I was like, we'll see what happens. And then um, my boss here at Newsy ended up seeing the documentary and was just like, we need you to cover stories like this. Wow. So I came here and I basically covered every dream story that I had. You're, I mean, looking through your portfolio of work, it is it's all these stories that are powerful and important and need to be shared, I feel like. And you bring such a you bring such a great craft of storytelling to it. And I really, really admire that. Thank you. What what is it like being a pioneering Muslim woman in media? Do you feel like you really try to lean into your faith and be like, oh, I'm gonna lean on this as uh, as something that makes me unique or are you trying to go the direction of people being able to see completely past that as if that's not the reality? Oh my gosh. So that's kind of the goal. And I think that a lot, there's like this assumption, um, especially when people are on the forefront of like being firsts in this field or yeah. in any field, that there's this assumption that you're using your identity to like gain something. And I always say like my goal with this is to make 
it's so common that people look like me who look like me are in the newsroom that it's just as common as seeing someone like Diane Sawyer or Barbara Walters or Katie yeah, Kirk on it's TV. It's not a big deal. Like it's it and it's and it shouldn't be. No. Naturally, when there isn't that, you know, high number of of minorities in the yeah. newsroom, it's going to be something that stands out and that's just a part of the process. Mm. But you have to you have to take kind of those steps and 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 talk about it and encourage other people. Like I cannot tell you how many young Muslim women have reached out to me in the past six years saying, oh my gosh, you have encouraged me to pursue journalism. Because you didn't have anybody when you were starting out. No. And today, these people have you. And yeah, that's kind of crazy. That's, but I mean, they have they have me, feel? they have each other. Like, I mean, I'm not the only person. And I feel like it's it's an incredible responsibility, but I hope that I like just you know, I lead by just being myself and yeah. I, and I do it in a very unapologetic way. And a lot of times people aren't going to agree with what I do and people are going to. And, um, but just know that there's like a wide range of role models for them to take up. And, mm. um, I like, if you want to take me as one, then go for it. But I will always give you myself 110%. That's, that's really beautiful. Yeah. And that's thanks. so important. That's so good. So tell me about the things that you're passionate about telling stories about, like tell me about human trafficking. Where did that, you said that that passion started at 14 years yeah, old. Yeah. So <laughs> again, That's another Oprah thing. So early. I love um, it. I remember watching Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wu done on Oprah wow. after they wrote half the sky, which is a book about sex trafficking around the world and how education was like the key to alleviating it. Mm. And um, I was so captivated by it because I hadn't ever gone through like an extreme sexual assault I guess experience but I've had some sort of experience where even imagining what those girls were going through was something that made me sick to my stomach mm. and um and boys and I wanted to do absolutely anything and everything to help with that and I'm a very big believer in combining what your passion is and what your skill set is to causes that pain you. Mm. And if you're able to take that skill and combine it with the cause that pains you, then you are able to maximize on your potential. And that's kind of where I'm at with that. So after I watched that interview, I did everything that I could to read about, re read research papers, read books on this. Um, I Because you couldn't pretend that that didn't exist now that you were aware of no, it. No, you absolutely it, it can't. It hit your heart and you're like, I, I can't run for this. I've got to learn everything I can. Yeah. And so that was the issue that I did that with. And I think that a lot of times people feel overwhelmed with the issues of the world and are just like, oh my God, I need to take care of everything. I need to be a part of the solution for everything. And that, mm. that just like you just take it one, one thing at a time. And so for me, it was sex trafficking, but I also had my parents as an example. And so a couple years before that, when I was around 12 years old, uh, my mom we had come across a woman at a convention who was running a women's shelter for women and children. My mom is one of those people that like, she just cannot, it hurts her heart to see people who are hungry hmm. or even people in need. And so she started an effort at that time and like made this commitment to help this woman and the people who were staying in her shelter. And, 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 and my mom is a really big role model in the sense that the way that she went about it was very admirable. And she said, instead of saying, I'm going to bring you X, Y, and Z, she said, what do you need from me? Mm. And so at the time they needed toiletries. So we would run toiletry drives for the women and we would try to get them like the best products that we could. Um, and now these days, it's like, this is 11 years later, we do grocery runs, we do care packages, we do like grocery gift cards, but wow. like according to what they want. Yeah. So that was like my mom's thing. So for me, I was like, okay, what can I do? And my skill set is storytelling. And so mm. I was going to try to take, whether it was the clothing line or whether it was through local television stories that I did, radio, or now doing a d whole documentary series, um, I was going to combine that skill with this this cause that pained me. And so, and I, I truly believe that, that those efforts are what allow you to maximize on who you are and the best version of yourself. I think that's so beautiful because I think a lot of people could easily be listening to this and be like, man, like Nora is like changing the world. She's doing this amazing thing. 
I've got to go and I've got to film a video about human trafficking. And please do. Yeah, well, but the reality is if that's not their strength, you know, it's much better for them to lean into their strength and and do their own specific unique thing. Maybe yeah. they're... So, I mean, one thing that I did when I was in college was t- like was anything that ignited any type of fire in me, I would I would try. Mm, so, I would good. encourage people to try try everything and look into everything that interests you and don't feel overwhelmed that you have to take on everything but I promise you there will be at least one thing that sticks at least yeah. one thing that just and you don't have to decide right away no you just of course get to not try it. yeah and like don't and, and I feel like a lot of people feel like maybe it's too late or maybe like they're just it's super overwhelming and you have to remember you have to take it like one day at a time and that these causes will always be around and you will always have room to grow. And if you are able to, you know, kind of challenge yourself and, and do a lot more self-evaluation and renewing your intentions, then you'll be okay. And I think that's a lot, like that's that's something that I feel like we have to remind people of all the time is that your intentions will always show through the work that you do. And so mm. if you are doing something with say, for instance, the intention of just like showing off. Like I, I feel like there's like this teetering line that people have when it comes to charity work or like doing good where it can look like you're showing off. Um, so even when, for instance, my family and I are doing like the grocery runs, I always try to call them good deed opportunities Whoa! because it's I something that. that it's not for you. Like, you know, it's so, I would never want people to think that I'm showing off by participating in this, but I'm, I want to give other people the opportunity to yeah. participate. It's an invitation. Yeah, it is. And, and, and I think that another thing is that when it comes to doing like work for a cause, the worst mentality that you can have is, oh, I'm like, if you're giving charity, like, oh, I'm giving to other people, like I'm doing them a favor. Yeah. And it's like, it's the complete opposite. In fact, they're doing you a favor. Like that opportunity being there is a test for you and it's a blessing like yeah. you are you have the ability to give whether it's money or your time or a skill if you have that ability to give then how like grateful you should be you know mm. oh, that's so good that's so good so right now you're working on this documentary series what are some of the next big things for you like where do you see your trajectory you know years down the road you're doing such a good job where you're at and so i don't want to be like what are you doing like next like i yeah. you know don't want to unsettle you but you know long term where do you see yourself um i think long term i just see myself i think doing the same thing that i'm doing now in terms of storytelling and finding the stories that i feel like people don't really have access to but just on different platforms and yeah. on a bigger scale So I absolutely love what I'm doing. I love being on tour and and talking about my journey. I love writing. I love um, reporting. And I think that I am in a perfect spot right now where I'm doing everything that I love. And so growth for me would be to do it on bigger scales and Mm. different platforms and challenging myself with stories that maybe I wouldn't be so comfortable doing and really taking on, you know, like obstacles and opportunities along the way. That's really good. This is something I was thinking about uh, this week a lot. I, it popped up in my brain and in a few conversations I was having. But I feel like as communicators and as storytellers, it's really easy to end up almost preaching to the choir with the messages we're yeah. passionate mm-hmm. about. And you seem to me like somebody who is really intentional about not only creating good stories, but getting it in front of the people that maybe need to see it. Uh, and you can correct me if, if that's not, something that you're that you're thinking about but i would love to hear your thoughts on uh what it's like to create things that that you kind of push outside of the normal boundaries of you know your bubble because that's something that i'm trying to figure out for myself that's, i love that you even brought that up because that's exactly what i'm doing even really? here at newsy like Good. me taking on this job was a challenge to myself in that i was going to be bringing this platform stories in front of people that normally wouldn't watch the stories that I'm bringing Mm. or see people who look like me. That's good. And part of that comes with, like what comes with the territory is a lot of flack and hate and negativity because the internet sucks sometimes. Yeah. But also like treading new waters, you know, and just being in places that may have rejected you before and and challenging people to to actually hear the story out and hear us out. And I do pretty bold things that you know are met with some criticism sometimes but always with the intention that 
there are, I think everybody is deserving of the story and that, um, it is our responsibility to bring light to those that may have not had it. And Mm. so that is always my intention behind, behind the way that I carry out certain stories that I do or certain interviews that I do or certain talks that I give. That's really, really beautiful. I'm just loving this conversation. I'm loving yeah. hearing your story. I'm loving hearing uh, your intentionality <laughs> behind what you do. And it, it runs so deep. Maybe as we close, I want to ask for somebody out there who they feel like they aren't represented in the place that they want to be. They don't see a role model that they can kind of follow after. Um, what kind of advice would you give them on stepping forward into what feels like the unknown and what kind of advice would you give to people who are kind of stepping forward into the unknown? Stepping into the unknown is a requirement of the journey. So I always say that everything you want is just outside of your comfort zone. And if you're in a place of comfort and you're stagnant where you are, then you are doing the worst thing possible to yourself. It's great to be on your hike to success, but it's also great to be in the valley of failure where you are knocked down and the only place to go is up. And that's a place that you're often going to be when you are being your most authentic self and, and, and trying to create and, um, bring whatever it is that your skill or your gift is into reality. And like, that's just a part of the journey. And so walking into the unknown is something is the only way that you're going to like see endless possibility. And I think that a lot of us have insecurity about, um, you know, talking to certain people or taking on certain risks, but just understand that every single person around you has insecurities. Every single person around you has vulnerabilities. And we oftentimes find ourselves in a place where we see others as, like, man, they totally got their stuff together. They seem like they have a perfect life. They seem like, you know, um, they never went through anything. And in reality, like, that's not the case. And and you would know that if you just talked to them, if you just asked, mm. if you just listened to an interview that they've done. Um, another thing is a lot of times we make the mistake of having conversations in our heads, like assuming that people are thinking something or saying something that really just oftentimes isn't the case. And so putting yourself in that position of knowing that this risk could be the best thing that you ever do and putting yourself in the mentality that even if this is a failure, that there's still good in this and that there's a reason that this happened and that there's a reason that this was a part of your life is just kind of a guaranteed way to growth, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you hear that quote? Nora said, stepping into the unknown is the requirement of the journey. Everything you want is just outside your comfort zone. Goodness gracious, that is a tweetable quote. That was amazing. Nora is so inspiring to me. I'm blown away by the way that she has pursued this dream with with so much creativity, courage, and curiosity. She's creating something amazing and she's using her platform to make a difference, to tell stories that matter. I connected with her on such a deep level. You should absolutely check out Noor's incredible work at nortagori.com. You can see her storytelling and journalism and see her on the air. It's really wonderful to watch. You can also follow her on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can also share this episode anywhere you want on the internet. You can find the show notes for this week's episode at soundsgoodpodcast.com slash nor. And you can find out more about the podcast and what we do here at Good Good Good, the company that makes sounds good at goodgoodgood.co. Goodness gracious, that is a mouthful. I don't know why we called it that, but (laughs) goodgoodgood.co. If you're new to the podcast, if this is the very first episode you've ever heard, welcome. We hope that this isn't the last. You should absolutely go and check out some of our other episodes. If you like this episode, you'll probably also like two more episodes from other incredible storytellers. The first is Katie Myler. Katie worked and lived in Liberia during the midst of the Ebola crisis and brought the world's attention to what was actually going on in Liberia. And the second is Jeremy Coward, a photographer and a humanitarian storyteller who has made a difference in the world in all kinds of crazy ways from just using his camera to starting a hotel that actually helps you change the world in your sleep. It's a wonderful story. Check those both out wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And with that, I think that's a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week, and we'll be back next week with another inspiring conversation with an incredible person. Sound good? 